Well, good morning, Grace Tribe. Y'all let me know that we're loud and clear. I think I have everything on and we should be good to go. We're going to take, uh, oh, about five to seven minutes just to do some prayer requests and ministry updates. Make sure you guys know what you need to know. But Rob says loud and clear on this end of San Antonio, Texas. Well, good. Then it's probably good on this end if it's good on your end. Dan White, good morning on the YouTube side. Vanessa, good morning. Great to see you. Roger Hull, also known as Little Haas. If you've ever seen Roger on his huge motorcycle going around doing missions work around the country, uh, you'll realize that Lil Haas is a great name for him. <laughs> it's wonderful to see you guys. Ronnie Swain, good morning. Jim Welch, good morning. I'm seeing people in the comments. Andrea Morissette, great to see you this morning. Vanessa, Jim, wonderful to have you guys. Listen, we are in for a treat. In a few minutes, I'm going to be bringing on my good friend and my cohort in grace-based leadership, like few others, uh, Daryl Lyons. And I was just talking to him before we got started. I, I honestly can't believe I haven't had him on already and more often. Uh, it's a huge oversight on my part that I wasn't sort of running him down and making him uh, hop on the show. But uh, I'm excited. I don't want to jump the gun too much uh, with him, but you're going to love the chat with him. He knows grace. He knows life in Christ. He was just using the words, you know, this vine branch relationship thing with me. So those of you who are regulars on the show will know that that resonates deeply with my heart. And yet here's a financial and entrepreneurial leader, uh, not just in San Antonio, but nationally and we're really privileged to get to know him and to work with him and his company, but also uh, to have him on the show today. So I'm very excited about that. If you are new here, hi there. My name is Mike Daniel. You're on Mike Q Daniel Live. It's a live broadcast, uh, but then we save it on a podcast and the videos are still available later. If you're watching this later, I'm so glad you're here. Chime in with your questions, with your prayer requests for the next few minutes, because even after the show is over, if you're watching the video, uh, we have volunteers who will scoop up your prayer requests and add them to our private prayer list uh, for our volunteer team. And uh, we will capture your questions for future broadcasts. So we really do want you to participate uh, like you're on the live broadcast, even if you're catching this at a later date. So listen, let's just come in the front door and shake off your jacket and hug a few, digitally speaking, hug a few necks and love on each other. Uh, share what's going on in your life, share how we can be praying for you. Maybe share a prayer update if you've asked for a prayer request um, previously and uh, just let us know that. We would love to do that. And here in about two minutes now, we're going to hop on with Daryl Lyons, CEO of Pax Financial. And more than that, uh, to me at least, uh, a good friend and cohort in grace. So I'm excited uh, if you haven't noticed and uh, so good morning, Rob. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, I saw a bunch of names fly by in the comments. June Cofield, wonderful to see you on the treadmill, walking it out with the Grace Tribe. I love that. I'm I'm drinking coffee. I'm javaing it out. Little Jesus. Well, I guess little Java, a lot of Jesus. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk a lot about our life in Christ as it pertains uh, to the areas of expertise that Daryl is bringing to the table here in just a moment. Judy Miracle, wonderful to see you. Um, and John, I'm sure, is floating around there somewhere. So when, there's John. Wonderful to see you, my friend. Okay, well, we're about there. I'm going to turn off my camera, and we're going to shift gears to bring on Daryl in just a minute. Listen, guys, I'm so glad that you are here. Donna Winter, great to see you. Christine, wonderful to see you. If you have financial questions, investment questions, retirement questions, especially as they pertain to our trust uh, and dependence and stewardship in life in Christ, uh, we've got the guy for you on the show today who is uh, my go-to in that uh, par paradigm. So glad that you're here. Not trying to put pressure on you, Daryl. He's waiting in the wings, but uh, we're in it together, buddy. But uh, he's the guy with the answers. And so I'm excited that y'all are here. Y'all hang on. I'm going to do a little switcheroo on the uh, my setup here, and we are about to go live. Glad you guys are here.
Awakening souls to our life in Christ. My name is Mike Q. Daniel, and we are celebrating all that we have in Christ Jesus by grace. Be sure to share your questions or prayer requests at MikeQDaniel.com. And I want to welcome you to Mike Q. Daniel Live with the Grace Tribe. Good morning, everybody, and good morning, Daryl. Thank you so much for being here. I'm honored. It's good to see you again. It's been a while. It has been a little while. We got like three minutes before the broadcast started to chat, and I thought, okay, probably coffee is in order. Just you know, I know. You realize we haven't yeah. talked probably since before COVID, so that's four years. I keep thinking it's been t- like a couple of years, but it's been forever. It has, but I stalk you, so I know you're doing good. Oh, good. Well, I I I show up at your office all the time. I just don't see you that often. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, for those of you who don't know, Daryl Lyons is an author. He is the CEO of a growing and amazing uh, retirement and investment uh, organization, financial advising organization. You can describe that a little bit better and more, yep. Daryl. Uh, and he's a good friend of mine. I've been invited by Daryl to speak at his Bible study and uh, work with some of the people in his uh, organization and uh, the accolades. We just don't even have time to share the accolades and associations that uh, recognitions of his organization. But as a CEO of a financial investment corporation with that kind of growth and that kind of success operating from stewardship of grace and finances, mm-hmm. even your name means peace. Pax Financial um, is just unbelievable. And so I'm so glad to have you on and to share a little bit about your book and what's going on in your life and work in ministry, because it's all ministry and mm. uh, want people to know you. So, so really, thanks for taking the time to be here this morning, Daryl. It means a lot. Yeah, thank you. This will be fun. And um, yeah, there's so much to share that um, if we don't get it all done, I'm, I'm happy to come back. Well, you gotta, I like, I, I, I really can't believe I was saying before, uh, the break and I brought you on that, um, I, I can't believe that I haven't sort of hounded you down and gotten you on the show. When we launched the YouTube channel, originally you and I were kind of brainstorming what that might yep. look like in terms of impacting families and reaching out to people from a grace perspective in all areas of their life. And, uh, of course I was excited about PAX and the work that we were getting to do with you guys. So, uh, anyway, here we are, whatever it's been three years later, four years later, um, on it together, which I love. Thank you. So you've got Vanessa in the comments. I don't know if you can see the comments there, Daryl, but uh, there are some questions. And if you turn on comments, what you'll see there is a conglomeration of YouTube and Facebook comments. There's also folks joining on the website at MikeQDaniel.com. Um, and they can ask questions and comments. Some of them will catch some of them. Volunteers will send me later, but, uh, wanted to make sure you could at least catch some of those if you wanted. Thank you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you first came into this work that you're doing and got packs started and, uh, and then talk a little bit about where your journey in grace met you in that process. Yeah, I love it. You know, it's so so awesome to be on this platform because I feel free. Like there's some <laughs> like there's some platforms. So I get interviewed on secular platforms, even Christian platforms. And I'm trying to do, you know, yeah, this I just can just relax and just kind of talk like, you know, nor, like these are, you know, you, we we get each other. So, yeah, I um uh we didn't grow up with money and um, we lived in a little, uh, there was a little trailer park right on the side of Casterville. And I remember edging the mobile home and it has skirting, has white skirting on it. And I was edging it. And if you get too close, you crack the skirting. And I thought, how do people have houses with foundations, like nice, thick concrete foundations in the, and one of my friend's dad's, in Casterville was a banker and uh, he, they had a nice house with a foundation. And I thought, well, being a banker might be a ticket. So I ended up being very curious. This was really the beginning of me being curious about money and, and, uh, and authentically, and you know, this by now, this was just an awesome God thing because prior to that, I thought I wanted to play college football and I thought that was my ticket. And I didn't have anything else in my life that, that was interesting except college football. And, and then, you know, this, this idea of, uh, being curious about money never 
ever stopped from that moment. Uh, mm. So I ended up getting a job at Bank of America right down the intersection of Bandera Woodlawn and San Antonio, which is predominantly Spanish speaking. Mm -hmm. um, one of the highest teenage pregnancy areas in the entire country is in that mm -hmm. area. Wonderful ministry down there called uh, the Hope Center that I still support right. and love today. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then I went in the San Antonio area, the Hope Center is an amazing uh, multi-denominational outreach, uh, primarily for homeless, but for uh, lots of needy people who find themselves either in crisis or even chronic uh, neediness. And so uh, when I was pastoring, we as a church were down there all the time. And since then, we've done some events down there at the Hope Center, but can't recommend it enough. I know there's a lot of people that aren't in San Antonio who have never heard of that. So anyway, yeah, go ahead. no, it's amazing. Um, but that was right in my, the neck of the woods of, of St. Mary's University, where I went to school. Got it. Uh, man, God was so good because, you know, lacking confidence. My mom had me when she, she was 16. My dad was 20. Just, we just kind of fumbled through life as growing up. And then, so just trying to find myself and, and this accounting professor came up to me. I'll never forget her. And she came up to me. She was, Daryl, you're pretty good at accounting. Do you want to tutor other people? And it was kind of just in that moment. It was just this God confidence. Wow. I was like, man, I may be good at something. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, wow. then I took this investment course. This was 1998. I took this investment course. And the professor said, whoever makes the most money at the end of the semester gets the best grade. And I won that. And so I'm putting all this together in, in uh, thinking deeply about it. And, and by the way, I love Jesus, always love Jesus, despite being uh, doing nonsense in college. Sure. I was the guy that would stay out till three o'clock in the morning and then show up at meet me at the pole with my Bible kind of hungover. Yeah. And uh, I was the only one there. <laughs> but <laughs> but, um, but that was just a wonderful just. I just, it was just an awesome dance. God and I just were continuing. He just loved on me all the way through uh, college. And so he, um, he, 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 he just orchestrated this series of events to where when I graduated December, 1999, I started in this industry right away. And it, it's just been this perfect alignment with being in his will. It's been beautiful. That's great. And so when you came to know uh, Christ's life, was that through hearing Bill? Was it at a conference? Was it on a radio show? How did you start to see this idea of the indwelling life in union by grace? Yeah, so this was um, about the time. So prior to me um, understanding this idea of Christ, his life, um, I was, I had a couple other mantras that guided me. Um, and it was one of the scriptures was in Proverbs, go like an ant thou slugger, consider his ways and be wise, wow. which is a pretty burdensome scripture yeah. to have to be your um, life right. purpose. Um, secular, a secular coach told me once that your attitude in life should be mental toughness, extra effort. So I also adopted that, mm. which again becomes pretty mental heavy. toughness, extra effort. Is that yeah. how you do? Wow. Yeah. That's, that's not burdensome strife at all. <laughs> I know it was very burdensome. Oof. I mean, and um, so that's kind of what I adopted. And so if you can imagine, that's the rhythm I was at um, for, for really most, most of my early life. And then um, I had a series of events. I was in the business and I placed a, a trade and I lost a lot of money. So we manage people's money, a place to trade loss. It was permanent loss. The guy was very mad. He had a beard. He had guns. He was just mad. He wasn't going to shoot me or anything, but just an angry guy. Now that happened. Then I remember um, going for a jog in San Diego. I left my phone in the hotel and I got lost. Okay. That happened. Mm -hmm. And, and then it was like these series of fumblings, just like, and I'm, and I, and I don't know if you've ever been in a season in life where like everything's going wrong. Like, God, I mean, and, and I, this is what I do. I'm like, I'm an idiot. Like, so then I'm, I'm relaxing as February. I remember this, this is kind of the climax of, of when this happened and I'm just frustrated. And so my wife's expecting our third baby. So I drive our uh, Jeep Cherokee up to HEB, the grocery store. And I take Claire, my two-year-old with me. And so we're going to get groceries. And Claire's in the back seat in a little princess dress. And um, we rolled down the windows. It was a beautiful day, kind of sunglasses and leather jacket kind of day. And she st sticks her finger between the window and the frame and kicks the electronic up button and her fingers get stuck. So she's screaming. I pull over. I can't get it down because she doesn't release her foot. And um, I 
finally get it down. She finally releases her foot and her finger severed and it's mm-hmm. hanging on and blood all over her princess dress. So I rushed her to the hospital and uh, Dr. Phelps was there is North, North Central Baptist. And they uh, successfully reattached her finger. But that night, my wife lost our third baby. So this is all kind of coming together and um, it's, it's heavy and mental toughness, extra effort can't push me through this and neither can go like an anthal slugger consider his ways and be wise so i knew a guy with some gray hair that had read the bible a little bit more than me that was bill loveless so i called bill up maybe over breakfast taco and um and coffee i don't remember necessarily and i just remember him just telling me about this idea of a vine branch relationship um i remember him telling me a story about how um a preacher said how's that working for you and I'm like, I I can relate to that. It's this is not working very well for Become me. Become his catchphrase. And when I came and did your Bible study a couple of times, everyone's passing that around. Yeah, how's that working for you? <laughs> I know, right? Exactly. And it wasn't working for me. This whole mental toughness, extra effort, even being a Christian, mm. that I had even studied apologetics and um, could you know rap with the best of them, and um, but it wasn't working mm. at all. And I there's no and I. So the idea, so he, he shared with me this idea of the vine branch relationship and then how we go into, we kind of trickle over to Galatians and recognize the fruit of the spirit and, and what I wasn't experienced with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, self-control. I wasn't really experiencing that. And not that that is the purpose of the vine branch relationship, but it's just the wonderful, beautiful overflow. And, and it's not even for us, it's for others. And so, um, But none of that was part of my experience. None of that had I ever heard. And I've been to a lot of services. I've been to all kinds. I've been to Catholic. I've been to Baptist. I've been to Charismatic. I've been to Methodist. Um, Never heard this vine branch relationship ever. It's all about what you do, not what he's doing. Like, it's really hard to look. I I work with pastors that know the truth of life in Christ, but they struggle with how to apply the scripture that they're teaching. Like, what do I give people to do? And I said, well, it's got to be about your relationship with God because he's going to do what he wants. Like, you don't get to cause what you want from him. You don't get to earn it. um, And you don't get to get him to empower you to do, to make you more sovereign (laughs) <laughs> to do what you want. Like there's no economy by which you can cause blessing or control outcomes. It's just going to be relational. So whatever you're teaching, it has to inform your trust in God and whatever he's going to do. That's all he's working on in your life. And that's, that's it's it. really hard to turn the application of what we know into just a relational grace dependent paradigm. Well, you know, and, and, and I'm sure there's maybe even some, people that it just it clicks with them maybe i don't know for me i just had this cerebral thing where i need formulas and checklists motivational speeches all that stuff you know right. uh, you know i'm kind of from that tony robbins camp right. where I, but, um but man i uh i just i just couldn't believe it and so from that point on i just really just started to um really deeply um, apply, and I won't even say apply, but just a respond to God's pursuit right, of my life. Right. You know Engage what I mean? Engage in that from a different perspective. And then, and then, um, what I've seen over my life is that there's been some rooms in my house that I've yet to let God clean. Um, and, and even seeing and getting to, uh, getting him to, um, getting to see him clean some of these rooms, even today is just so much fun. Yeah. Um, and so I've enjoyed this relationship and, and, and it's ongoing and it's, um, and, and, and so I lead a group of men, which I have for, since this, since I learned this, I couldn't help but gather other men, right? Hey, I, I got something new. You got, I've, what you're doing is not working. I promise you. And then we've been walking together for, gosh, I've been walking together with different groups of men for, um, for 15 years now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was trying to remember when I first came. Uh, I know Bill was meeting with your group in your old conference room, previous, you know, an earlier facility, and I was invited. And I didn't, I didn't know you guys. I was like, sure, you've got a group of people coming to a Bible study, yeah, and you need yeah. me to fill in, or sure, I'll do. Because Bill and I have done stuff together since, well, since you graduated from college, I or high school or whenever, nineteen ninety nine. So, um, wow, yeah. So anyway, I was excited to do that. And I was like, who are these guys? They're sitting in this schmancy conference room of financial, you know, powerhouses 
talking about the grace of God. Like, I, this is phenomenal. And so, uh, anyway, it, it's been a great because my background's in in corporate development, uh, uh, you know, executive coaching and in corporate training. And so, I kind of left that and got into ministry, and realized that religion and corporate paradigms were exactly the same. And came to know Christ's life, and and yeah. Bill and I became friends not long after that. And so, uh, when I then sort of returned to a corporate venue that wasn't uh, in the same way performance yeah. driven, that was sort of grace dependent, I just went this this is what was missing back in the day when I was doing corporate stuff and didn't know any better. And so anyway, I just love. I love packs. I love what y'all are doing. Uh, my money is where my mouth is in this, folks. <laughs> I am a uh, fervent, uh, full-paying, regular customer of Pax Financial. Um, have been there for years, and they've um, so. And you know, Daryl and I don't don't meet. I have a, a you know an account manager with them, and uh, I'm a poor, lowly non-profit leader, <laughs> but it's been wonderful to have people you can trust to manage finances in a way that is good for me so that I don't, I don't have to be that, that guy. And, and guys, especially, I think if you're a, a husband and a father and a business guy or a pastor, or, you know, maybe those aren't all of the elements of your life, but I think we feel a burden to steward and protect and be kind of performance driven by nature. If the flesh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, has its way. And so it's an incredible thing when we often feel the pressure to always be the guy, to not have to be the guy that figures it out and makes it happen we can lead by empowering and I've am learning to do that, it, you know, in finances and in other areas of my life and ministry that our empowerment is leading. It's not us causing it's us empowering rightly. And so yeah, best stewardship good. move we've made. In fact, I was talking to Stasa right before she left for work, uh, said, I, hey, I have Daryl coming on the show today. She's like, yeah. really? It's like, yeah, if you were running off to work, I'd bring you on. You could say hi. So anyway, we're very appreciative of you, you and the, the group that you've put together. And so I just want people to know my endorsement is real and authentic and I don't know, 10, yeah. 15 years old. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. That means a lot. And you know, it's been a, it's been an interesting journey too, because you think about like, um, where it resonated with me, this idea of Vine Branch relationship, but it wasn't, easy to translate that to the business sure. um because uh i i kind of wanted to i don't know i was told somewhere along the way that they had to be separate and so i was very sensitive but there was been there's been a lot of uh, I, I share a quick story with you if that's okay Please. about so um i did this giving challenge with our team and we gave money to our employees to then turn around and give to nonprofits. So that way they could have the experience and joy of giving. And we filmed it and it was done and it's on YouTube now. You can see it several years old. So I did it, gave God some credit along the way. One of my top clients came to me and said, yeah, that was pretty good. I'm glad you did it. But that whole religious thing that did that, that was just a little too much. And I was, and, and, and I know, separate, right? yeah. And, and so I was like, okay maybe I shouldn't. Okay. I know you're going to make fun of me, but I, I got really lukewarm and I feel bad for even doing it. I go, yeah, I probably should keep it separate. And so the next video I did, I didn't give God any glory. Like I just did my thing and gave the money out and then did the nonprofit thing. But then I watched the video and I go, man, what did I do? Mm -hmm. And it was at that moment, God, uh, he, he, it's just amazing. It's just beautiful how he does things. I just began to just fully integrate. I was like, mm -hmm. you know, I can't, this is hypocrisy. And um, they so are that, integrated, like they're inseparable. Yeah. So when we act like our faith and hope in Christ doesn't pertain to our financial stewardship, or a good friend of mine is one of the foremost experts in uh, conservation and stewardship and loves and shares the grace paradigm. In fact, I need to get her on the show, but sort of nationally recognized like you. And um, if we try to separate the things that he is calling us to steward from our dependence upon Christ, whether that's a family or finances or work opportunities or our gifting, then we're completely missing the point. The whole point is that those things are relational. 
Our finances are given to us so that we can engage and grow relationally with Christ. Our life is not the product of our finances or the product of our family or the product of our work. Our life is Christ. And those are the context of uniquely knowing him for each one of us. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I totally get it. And there's consequences of missing that point because what we have often done, and I've recognized this, and I could speak to the financial space because I've worked with the Goldman Sachs and the Black Rocks and the big companies. I still have relationships with executives there. And um, Christians have... Uh, People may not know what the implication of that is. I mean, I do, but we may circle back to that. Sure, yeah. Some and Not great stewards from a biblical standpoint of support. no and happy to dig in wherever yeah. you feel appropriate but um we christians have kind of created these little bubbles and and uh and then we find that the the secularist have taken over certain segments of the economy yeah and we wake we've up opted when, out we've opted out and, and we we ask ourselves well how did this happen and we've got comfortable and and complacent and 55% of the world's wealth is held by Christians. Mm -hmm. And over the last, we've just become- Wow, 55% I'm not of the world's wealth. So not even the US, which is yeah. you know still historically predominantly Christian paradigm. 55% mm -hmm. of the world's wealth is held by Christians. Yep. I've not heard that, Daryl. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah, but we've opted out of being engaged. And yeah. um, a complacency is, is really a, an interesting tool that the evil one can use and will use, and I've seen it used. And so um, we we get very comfortable. Um, we think this idea of, we've adopted this idea of retirement as something that we, uh, uh, is is really for Christians when it's not. No. You know, we're called to pivot into another chapter of life. Now, right, we're not talking about leaving the workplace. We're not talking about saving for retirement. We're talking about empowering um, divine participation. Right. We're getting more and more empowered with the resources in our life. It, it, it very much so. I mean, at, the, at that point in our life, we have wisdom and time and maybe if we squirreled a little way of money. And so when it's just a beautiful opportunity because God has wired us to do that, to engage in um, the body of Christ and beyond. Yeah. Um, and beyond and beyond that. We are a blessing to those who do not know what we do not know. We can afford that by grace, right? It doesn't have to have a transactional benefit to us. We uniquely can afford to be outward focused. A hundred percent. But the, but the, but complacency, the evil one loves to tell us that you, you've earned this. And I understand you've worked hard. I get that you've earned this. So now it's time to just check out. Well, yeah. Studies show that when you do that, the probability of anxiety goes up, the probability of divorce goes up, the probability of heart attacks go up. So I've seen many, many people retire. And if they choose the secular route, the the, the route of death, yeah, um, it is right. physically death. Right. But the life that God has called us to live, the, the true life, um, when we engage in that, no, don't retire, we pivot. Um, we find that there's just a wonderful chapter waiting for us and 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 one that actually is not only fulfilling to us personally but also benefits the next generation and and, and makes a difference in this world yeah 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 you know if we can embrace people ask you know what will i do if we you know if and when we retire and i said when why would i ever retire like am i not increasingly doing what i'm aware of god wanting me to do what am i going to retire from now financial freedom increasingly by good stewardship and god rewarding if he continues to do that he might not all of our money might be worthless in 10 years but i can't plan for that so I'm going to steward what I have and I'm going to be available for what God's doing and he's going to be sufficient and he'll use my finances and my relationships and my gifting and my opportunity. So I may not be hopping on planes and speaking at events 20 years from now. Yeah. So I'm transitioning as God gives me opportunities to do things that I'm uniquely able to do. And that's both financial and relational in ministry and relational with my family. What I can do with my 29-year-old daughter today is very different than what I could do with her when she was nine, nine to 29, big difference. But am I less apparent? No. 
and I don't mean a parent less obvious. I mean, am I less of a parent? (laughs) No, but that role is very different. So what do the financial stewardship and relational stewardship and parenting stewardship and marriage stewardship and gifting stewardship look like in your life long term? Well, what it doesn't look like is opting out on what God's doing in our life. We're Mm -hmm. increasingly able to afford and trust what God is doing in our life. Mm, that's so good. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I also have to kind of balance out the conversation a little bit with um, what is, what well, does that mean? It's almost like, it's almost like, um, well, let me, I go on a rabbit trail real quick. Let me stay focused, but the, it almost okay. means, it almost means I shouldn't save. And Sounds so, like then don't steward because you're never going to stop, but it doesn't but, mean that. But the practicality is this is the practical thing that, that I have to wrestle with all the time is that at age 65, sometimes our mind and our body doesn't allow us to do some things. Right. And, right. and social security is bankrupt. Right. Um, and I can talk a little bit about solvency and, and kind of that if they want to get into that. But but um, but the reality is, is that I it's I I'm it's my responsibility to encourage people to squirrel away some money. So that way, if their mind or body doesn't work anymore, they can fall back on that. Right. And so right. that's 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 incumbent upon me and it's incumbent upon widows because I do spend a lot of time helping widows navigate life. And unfortunately, um, I've had more than a handful of of and it's often the men, <laughs> the men uh, try to do things uh, creatively or, or, you know, think outside the box. And and, right. and uh, <clears throat> then they find themselves in a, in a pickle and, and they don't have enough money for right. their for their widow. Yeah. Yeah. There's a world system that we're not. uh um, you know, we're in the world, but not of the world. So we're not divorced from that in the sense that we're in a system that, uh, God can use for what he's doing. Uh, like, like he used the Roman empire to spread the gospel. Uh, you know, there's a whole economy that he has set up in the secular world to show the contrast of our freedom in Christ in those venues. Well, that's no different in our finances. So I'm a huge advocate for people saving and investing and using those finances to increasingly express the freedom that we have in Christ. Like I am not against financial freedom. I'm just against us because we're not living for the money. We should be financially free with our $5 or our $5 million or Mm -hmm. our 50, like our freedom doesn't change based on our finances, but free from the system of the world that demands, um, uh, that, that limits our options for how that can be expressed. So, uh, you know, we kind of do what you got to do, but we don't have to do anything. We really are free in Christ. What if we looked at all of those constraints and all of those opportunities as an opportunity to walk with him in the circumstances that he's still sovereign over? So my finances are limited. Is God sovereign over how he uses that and what he's going to have me doing because of the financial constraints in my life? Absolutely. Um, when Jesus told you know Peter and the disciples to you know go and and catch a fish and, you know, open the fish's mouth and pay Caesar the denarius. He, he still had to go catch the fish Mm -hmm. that people like, yeah, that was divine provision. Yeah. But who caught the fish? Someone caught the fish and that's what we're doing. We're trusting God and we're catching fish Mm -hmm. and we're paying, you know, Caesar, what is owed to Caesar, what Caesar's names on the secular things that honestly we don't need. Yeah. But Uh, we're recognizing God as sovereign in the process. And he uses that in our life. Was that experience not useful to the disciples? Of course it was, but it wasn't useful because they needed a denarius. It was useful because they needed to trust God for the whatever, for the denarius, for the government, for the opportunities, for the stewardship, for the gifting. Someone had a boat. Yeah, <laughs> someone yeah. went and got a fish and someone paid the the tax to get into the city. And uh, Jesus didn't deny the process. He was just sovereign over the process. I always think the Good Samaritan had money to pay to swipe the debit card at the hotel. Right. Right. Let's be that guy. What yeah. a gift. Yeah. He didn't start that way. He made yeah. that somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good mm. point. You know, I, one time I had a, a really cool God moment where I had a client come in, a uh, husband and wife. They only lived off social security. 
They came in. I was helping them with some stuff. They were happy as could be, married. Just it was awesome. I was like, man, that was pleasant. They're broke, but I was, they were very happy. I was like, oh, okay. And not long after that, same day, uh, another client came in, multi, multi million. No problem. Tons of money. Like never going to outlive the money. The anxiety that engulfed them was it was unreal, and I just couldn't cognitive it was cognitive dissonance for me right. sitting here and just contrasting these two stories both christians right. by the way and trying to reconcile how is this possible remember i'm studying money my whole life like nerding over money i got into this area of study called behavioral finance where you study neuroscience and psychology and finance and so i'm sitting here not this is not lost on me that god has kind of orchestrated these two contrasting uh, moments in, in for you for me and i'm sitting there camping in this going wow god this is i i, I gotta sit here for a moment and um, I just recognize that that uh, and I've, met, I've, met, I've I've worked with a lot of very wealthy people sure. and <laughs> America has is is really, um, you know, obviously consumerism is an issue. But this idea of of, of building out this wealth for a, a purpose beyond God is really dangerous. It's not just cute and funny. It is it is completely dangerous. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, Daryl. I mean, we could talk around these ideas. We haven't even started to get into leadership and entrepreneurialism, but we've got to talk about your book. Like, like I, my motivation for pulling you is you just wrote another book. This is your fourth or fifth. It's about fourth. Yeah. Fourth book. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's pretty exciting. So I, I had it around here and I couldn't find it just as we were going live this morning. Uh, but if you have a copy, I'm going to, I like, I'm the one asking you to do this, but if you can show people a copy and I'm going to put a link. Do I have a copy here? I might have, I have, I do not have a copy for some, I think somebody actually took my copy, but it's um, biblical responsible investing. And, and, you know, I'm surprised you didn't ask me in, about the United States government going broke and, and how we're <laughs> going to navigate through that. And Are you really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I thought that'd be fun, but we can do that another time. <laughs> yeah, dive in. I mean, no, no. I, I, I just, it's fun to talk about that in, in just because the body. So here's the thing for me is the body of Christ does get some interesting messages that are concerning, that yeah. are, um, they love, there's a lot of secular organizations and quasi Christian organizations that throw this bait out to the body of Christ and use fear to lure them in. And so I try to make sure I help the body of Christ discern what is truth and what is half truths. And, and there's just a lot, a lot out there. I've, I, um, I've spent a lot of time thinking deeply and studying the con artists that are in our community and, and beyond. And, and, and it's, it's disturbing. So part of my motivation is to just kind of help the body of Christ avoid those con artists, but yeah. even the panic. So what people don't realize is that there's that, the propaganda benefits somebody. And if you can't understand um, that the reason the message is what it is about the world's finances or about the U.S. government or about um, someone's benefiting from that propaganda. And so we have to move towards the middle of a more conservative way of thinking instead of these extremes of here's how I'm going to make tons of money tomorrow. And here's how, you know, the world's doomed and we have no chance of, okay, the reality is never the extreme. Someone is benefiting by evangelizing an extreme perspective and uh, calm stewardship because we trust God, not finances anyway. So we're just going to walk through what's in front of us. Calm stewardship has a way, uh, there's a system that people um maybe underestimate of compounding of consistency mm -hmm. of trusting over time uh that that god is is it is at work and so i i just see that god has given us a tremendous instrument in capitalism in the u.s government in the financial market that um is neutral and is being used for lots of evil. That doesn't make the system evil, right? I my my uh, my coffee cup. I could beat someone over the head with it, or I could drink coffee out of it. One's yeah, yeah. you know obviously yeah. righteous and holy and divine. <laughs> yeah, and one's yeah. evil. 
And we just need to look at the secular world and the financial markets as being influenced, kind of like the soul of man can be influenced by evil and an instrument of evil, and they can be an instrument for good. And I want people that are watching and growing in grace and understanding union with Christ and increasingly walking in the affordability of Christ's indwelling life in his finished work to be um, leveraging Mm -hmm. the financial and governmental instrument that America, at least for this season, uniquely has. It's a great point. And actually, it kind of does parallel to the content of the book. So thank you for bringing that up. I do unpack a chapter on um, the the economic systems, um, the capitalist system. um, And uh, I I, I believe, uh, honestly, it's brilliant to me. Um, Again, being a student of it, it's fascinating because I don't think we recognize how uh, smart and, and intelligence versus, you know, uh, intelligence is one thing, but right. um, of course, you know, the, the integrity is another, but just intelligence alone, yeah. this economic system is brilliant because I've got a chance to hang out with some of these people. It's brilliant. It's I mean, America has a different, this is different. And and so our ability to, to do this thing, thing with money is exceptional. And um, so then I think about like 100, 150 years ago, again, I didn't grow up with money. So if I wanted to move from lower class to middle class, I, I, there was really not a pathway there. I would have been a serf, well, you know, a peasant, you know, pretty much the rest of my life and my kids, my kids, kids. And so this whole system allows for us to be able to make generate or not, to, to uh, use this mechanism to provide generational change. Absolutely. And. My and, kids were not born, my kid, my one child, was not yeah. born into the same conditions that I was, which was highly indebted and performance driven. Well, my daughter is pretty freed up spiritually. And I mean, I, I wish that was more the focus of our life in this season of our life, but, but still born into circumstance, pretty freed up spiritually and has a whole different prospect financially. And it's not because I make more now than I did in the corporate world. Believe me. <laughs> It's the opposite of that, but it's just because we're in a system that provides for a scalable transition generation. We're not born into a condition we can't influence. Yeah, it's really unbelievable. I think we take it for granted. And what happens for my, a lot of my Christian peers, not a lot of them is that they, they get this spirit of fear and timidity and not boldness and sound mind. And Mm -hmm. so they hear these messages of um chaos and then they step back and then what i do is i wake up and i look and i see that a a group of secular non-christians have accumulated wealth because they were just they didn't have this fear they didn't they they just went we we're making decisions out of fear in the body of christ right now with our money because of the identity crisis with the worldliness of money 100 percent, and and that's not valid money is not of the enemy love of money, it drives uh, all kinds of error. And so, man, we are just freer than we know. Let's, the greatest artists and architects and scholars of, you know, past centuries were Christians. They were inspired by and informing. All of our hospitals have Christian names on them. And that's a generation and a half away from a, a Christian culture. That's the level of influence of Christendom. Someone started those hospitals out of affluence. Someone started those outreaches to indigent populations out of affluence. And I, it's not my goal to pursue affluence. It's my goal that people don't have an identity crisis with the tools that God has given the secularists and the Christians to utilize for the economy that we're operating in. The economy that we're operating in is grace-based. Christ is enough, finished work, indwelling life, uh, new covenant reality of who we are. So let's use that for to that end. It's 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 one that, that I think that message continues that drum needs to be beat because um, we're kind of making decisions in fear and we won't admit it, um, but, but I'm seeing it a lot. And um, and I understand, right? You're hearing a lot. I mean, there's, I'm, I'm not, I'm not right. empathetic to the messaging that's out there. I'm just trying pr- pr- try to provide clarity that a lot of the messaging specifically targeted to the Christian community is one that is rooted in half truths right. that's anchored to fear 
Mm-hmm. And um, and I'm, I want the body of Christ to step away from that and realize they weren't given the spirit of fear and timidity, but of boldness. And, and the last part of sound mind and using our noggin to make uh, decisions in Christ. And so I think if we continue to kind of get to that place and realize that there's been the evil one that's kind of um, woven this message of fear in the marketplace, specifically yeah. targeting Christians, I think we can get back to to building wealth, not for our own um, personal ambition, but rather for the body of Christ. Right. Yeah. yeah. We don't realize that we're as okay in Christ in even poverty, right? He is no less sufficient in my poverty than he is in my affluence. And so, and I'm not, I mean, as an American in our society today, who's at least for a few years made some good financial uh, stewardship choices, we're all affluent relative to, you know, someone down the road or another. We're country. all rich. We're all, we're all rich. pretty rich. Like if, if you can go out and get a hamburger, when I was in the Philippines, that was a, a treat. Like we took uh, some pastors to a McDonald's and bought hamburgers. and It was like the greatest thing they've ever experienced. And so we have this paradigm. Um, you know, when I was in, in uh, India, right. yeah. there was no clean water. Like I was going to have to drink it and I was going to be sick because oh. there's just no. And so there's. It, it's crazy how we had to hike because of the lack of infrastructure into this Tibetan village and work with uh, people who are hiding in a little tin oven of a building to be able to praise God together. Uh, I mean, we just have no no understanding of how affluent we are that that I can get an eye prescription. So so anyway, we are affluent as a society and most of us relative to the rest of the world are pretty affluent. So Mike, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I noticed a Facebook question on gold. Should I address that? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um I yeah, want to so make sure I, I, let's I, make some practical steps. And you were gonna unpack a little bit about uh a chapter in the book, and I think we've well it was it was mainly yeah, no, 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 we did good. It was mainly on the con artist, um uh the world uh, uh, you know that really we've uncovered a lot in the book. The one area that I would say that we we didn't we covered con artists, which is something I addressed in the book. We covered just the idea of this system that is uh, something we take for granted. Um, and then when I, I want to just make sure that people know um, about there's there's actually some interesting movement in in the in the uh, in Wall Street where now we're actually able through technology to screen out companies in client portfolios that are behaving antithetical to biblical worldview. And so that's new movement. And then we're also seeing some um, uh, you get a proxy vote. You get to vote for a board of directors, which is really cool. And we're Christians are starting to actually use those votes um, to push back against agendas that undermine a biblical worldview. Namely, mm. the Equality Act is probably the most significant one, which is far from equality, which would actually right. undermine your ability, Mike, to speak about biblical marriage um, right. without fines or imprisonment. So we have to use this right. uh, m- this system in proxy voting uh, and, and being able to have a voice in Wall Street. And that's happening today, which before we became complacent, we recognized that and we saw it this complacency play out with Target and Bud Light. Now there's a, a significant movement in the body of Christ on Wall Street to push back against that. And you'll see it in real time, um, but just want to encourage the yeah. body of Christ that that there's some real movement happening there. That's good. So is there a mechanism, you've piqued my interest, uh, is there a mechanism by which we can know, like maybe as of my financial advisor, which PAX is, I wonder if y'all can provide me recommendations of those votes for the things that we're invested in, because we have to submit the votes or can we proxy vote? Like, can you proxy vote for those investments on our behalf, knowing the uh, values that you'll make those decisions on? Like, how can we, I don't want to track all of the companies uh, that- yeah that my portfolio has some little tiny percentage of a stock in, I, I can't track that. It's really a good question. So three answers to that question. One, PAX, uh, when you own individual stocks, the vote is your your responsibility. Clients have asked PAX to vote for their individual stock positions. And, and there's unique infrastructure and legality behind it that we're still working through. Okay. So it's not happening today, but we are working through that. Hopefully one day we can um, get 
break through that. However, those that own funds, exchange traded funds, the legal process is the vote, the proxy vote has been passed along to that fund company. So the, it, what's good is that uh, most of our clients have a combination of individual stocks and funds. So on the fund side, those votes are being casted if it's, a, it's, if it's an asset manager that shares our values. That's phenomenal. Yeah. So one of the things that y'all have done is put together some investment uh, instruments that are more, I don't know that I would say they're Christian based, but they negate those things that are working directly against Christian values. Hundred percent. Some some of it them would are be because you can then use those investment managers to vote in a way that you would affirm. Yeah, and that's that gets me excited because that's where change Man, takes place. I did place. not realize that. Yeah, I need to opt in more to that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't opt yeah. in as much as I should have. <laughs> yeah, and so we're seeing a massive appetite for that. And um, our responsibility as advisors is to make those matches, is find those asset managers, make sure we match the ones that are right for the clients. Um, we don't superimpose our no. beliefs. We ask the clients if that's important to them, then we'll uh, introduce it. If not, right. then we'll we'll use other strategies. But um, and and historically, there hasn't been any trade offs on returns. However, this past year, it's been a challenging one because. Most returns have taken place in about five to seven stocks, and those stocks specifically uh, are NVIDIA and Apple and Amazon, those right. and Facebook, Meta, those have, have used their platforms to undermine biblical worldview. So we've actually opted out of that, and good returns have come from that. So there is, in the past year, there has been a return trade-off. Uh, I don't see that going forward. We'll probably see more of a broadening out of returns in the economy. Sure. Um, yeah. So that's... Yeah, yeah. Different, different yeah I, I think that yeah. the peaks will have to even out until there's some other champions, you know, at some point, and it'll repeat itself with different groups over time. But well, I can't recommend your your book enough. You have 11 principles of biblical responsible stewardship in the book. Yeah. Is that what it yeah. is? 11 yeah. points? Yeah. Can you list them off? Um, so yeah. Heart, yeah, a I big mean, ask. Well, well, yeah, I can try my best. So one is the world's playing chess. Our checkers were playing chess. Uh, right. Watch out for the con artist. Um, uh, I talk about giving being one and, and what it means to give. Uh, there's some interesting studies there. I talk about mm -hmm. the proxy voting. I talk about screening out companies that are behaving antithetical biblical worldview. I talk about leaving a legacy. So that's kind of a handful of them there, a uh, little that's sampling. Great. Yeah. That's and great. then gold, I, I will say this on gold. I got to cover it real quick. Good. Is that okay, I'm glad you got excited about it. I'm not excited about it. I just have to. Come well, out. to respond to it, I mean, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no gold. I actually did a whole podcast on this recently, so it's fresh on my mind. Gold has been killing it. And a, and a lot of the thing about it, just keep in mind that a lot of the and I'm listening to the fact I was we were working closely with Charlie Kirk, a national international syndicate talk show host. And, and so a lot of these hosts, talk show hosts get sponsored by gold. So it's not uncommon for me to address gold. Gold has done really well this year. Um, I'd suggest that if you own gold, it's it's probably 5% of your portfolio, maybe 10%. Um, any more than that is is subject to risk because there has been long, long, long time periods where it does nothing. And then there's time periods where it does well. So I uh, I think it's fine. If if look, if if the if there's an an apocalypse, uh, gold's probably not what you want. Um, I think whiskey might sell more than gold. Uh, I think guns might work pretty well. So I, I, I don't know. I, in an apocalyptic scenario, there's other things I like. But if you like gold, you like gold. Just don't own too much of it, and uh, it'll be, it'll, it'll treat you well some, some years, and sometimes it won't. Yeah, and, and we're talking about markets, not assets. So the, the home that I own has value to me that will change in the market. The market value versus the intrinsic value of everything is different. When you buy something in a company or you buy a real asset, those have a real value and then they have a market value. And what we're talking about is, is kind of using people who are following those trends to uh, leverage out and compound interest in market value because the rocks that we call gold and the boards I build my house with don't really change in value. Uh, they change in perceived value. And that's where we can compound interest to earn uh, to earn sort of perceived value in the market over time. And so we're just not going to put our hope folks in in our, our true hope of sufficiency 
in the market value of things? Can we use that as a tool and an instrument to build influence within that system? Absolutely. But in heaven, we're going to be using gold as asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> and in uh, and and our home is going to be one that we move into uh, that someone else has made of something that is uh, not passing away. So let's remember that this is temporal and it's an instrument and we can be wise stewards of it and should be uh, because we want to influence outcomes. We want to spread the gospel. We want to be useful stewards of the gifts of God, but we're not living for the outcomes that we're manipulating in these temporal systems. We're living for and from the sufficiency of Christ and he can use my finances and my marriage, but he, and, and my home and my relationships and my giftings. But friends, he was the source. He's the source. Those are his instruments. He's the musician and, and my money is the guitar, right? Praise God. He can play it. I don't have to. <laughs> so, but I can participate. I can participate. So I just want to encourage those of you who maybe have opted out because you don't feel like you have much financial um, influence or opportunity, engage in the system that God has allowed us to participate in, in the same way that you engage in traffic. You don't have to love traffic, but I want you to get where he's taking you for what he alone can do in and through you. So, so use the it. system, use the system. Yeah. I, I really, I really appreciate that analogy with the traffic. I, I could, I'm going to, I'm going to think about no it. No one likes traffic. Of, Who likes traffic? Well, it's a, it's a great analogy in so many different ways. So I'm going to, I'm going to chew on that and that'll probably make another book somewhere. So thanks Mike. Sure, man. My yeah. gift to you. Hey, it's nine o'clock. I hear a clock chiming in the in the background and your time is so valuable. I really appreciate you being here. I'm sure our audience will have all kinds of questions. So I'd highly recommend folks. I have and will be giving away a few copies of Daryl's latest book. Um, he also has a great book on entrepreneurialism and um yeah, small uh, yeah. business, big pressure. I do have that one right here. Let me just share share it with your audience. This is my first one here. Oh yeah, yeah, that's it. When I looked at yeah. Amazon, I didn't yeah. see that cover. I guess, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, highly recommend that. And maybe we have you back on in a couple of months to to talk about that topic because I think we're missing out in the same way that we've opted out of kind of financial stewardship and ecological stewardship because of the the way that's being used in the secular world is false. And mm -hmm. we don't have to affirm that in order to be stewards of the earth. And we don't have to opt out of financial markets because of the way that's being used for, for evil. We don't have to opt out of those systems because it's being used in a way that the enemy has influence in. We can counter that influence for godly purposes. And in, in the same way, I think leadership and family are getting opted out of by a lot of Christians. That it well, seems we opted, hopeless. A great example is we opted out of the school system. Yeah. Like, and look and at so what's happened in the last it, uh, 50 years. Yeah. And, and, and so we can't opt out anymore. We have to be engaged in Christ. And I've I met some, in fact, I had a guy that, that was a secularist, about as secularist as you can imagine, out of California, does all this nonsense that read my book and I was so happy because he'll never read a Bible right ever. Right. But he read my book, which is if when you read it, you'll recognize I, I love Jesus. And so for him to read that, that I, I was happy. That was, that was awesome. Phenomenal. But I couldn't have done that if I would have created my own little bubble. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm in the, I'm in of the world, but not of the world. You know right. what I mean? Right. Yeah. Right. You get to walk saints. You get to walk as agents of grace in a system that the, enemy playing checkers when God's playing chess, right? 100%. And we get to participate in God's economy that supersedes the economy that we're walking through. But we don't do that by avoiding and opting out in country club Christianity. Like let's just surround ourselves with like-minded people and op out, opt out of worldly systems. We get to engage in the world systems without being worldly in our motive and our mode of operation. And so 100%. man- uh, and and you, I know, have such a heart for the family and for fatherhood and for parenting and for sort of community responsibility. We haven't even scratched the surface of that as our finances and stewardship impact that. 100%. So uh, that's maybe where we need to go uh, in yeah. the future. Daryl, anything you want to leave people with? 
No, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. It was a good conversation. Could have lasted a lot longer, so we'll have to do it again. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to do it again. So there's so much more to, to cover. Guys, if you have questions, if you have prayer requests, if you have biblical questions, maybe it's not on finances, but it's on, okay, if that's true, if God's my source, then what do I do with this situation? Um, please share those in the comments. We have some wonderful volunteers who will gather those up and share them with me, with me and we walk through them on Thursdays. We usually are handling people's questions on the Thursday show, but Daryl, thank you so much for being here, my friend, and uh, I look forward to having you back soon. You guys go and grab his book, Biblical Responsible uh, Investing. I almost said leadership. Biblical Responsible Investing. Uh, and get his previous book uh, on entrepreneurship, Big, what's it called? Big Pressure. Small Business. Small Business, small business, big, business pressure. big Pressure. Yep. yep. Uh, yep orange you. Cover, which I love yeah. too. So yeah, I anyway. Like orange. Thank you guys. As I always say, make today one in which you're not striving for the outcomes, but wanting to know Christ who is already your life. And as you know him more, grow in grace and go love like crazy. That's what Jesus looks like in and through you today. Y'all have a fantastic day. Thank you guys.